your breathing is the key to calming yourself down because you can lower your heart rate and calm yourself by the proper breathing techniques. And so we call this diaphragmatic breathing. And anyone in theater arts and, and who sings will do this type of breathing. It's also used in yoga and mindfulness, mm -hmm. where you take that deep breath, imagining that you have a balloon inside your stomach. Yes. And as you breathe in, the balloon expands. You hold it for a few seconds and you exhale slowly. And that slow exhale brings your heart rate down. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the second part of my interview with John Watkiss. If you're writing a speech and you decide that you're going to have some silence in there. What are you typically using that for? Is it for emphasis? Is it to make sure that they have like a palate cleanser before you get to the next point? Or, you know, how, how does that work for you? Excellent question. And so many different uses for it. <laughs> yeah. So one, as you said, maybe I've made a statement and I want to make that change to the next point. I want to give the audience time to think about what I just said and reflect on it before I go to where I'm heading next. We do this in music. We finish a verse and then there's that little pre-chorus in between. So if you think, can you feel the love tonight? Da, 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 da. So it's, it's not necessarily silence, but it's the end of the words. So you know that, oh, we're moving now. That's one element that you can use it to make transition. And the other way is to give people an opportunity to come up with answers to a question you just asked. Good point. And this is especially important because in a speech, you want people to reflect, you want them to think or imagine before you try to take them to where they'll be going next. So you ask that question and you pause and you look at them and then you can go on to your next point. Or I can say, and the words that came out of my mouth next were not the words that I expected. And that pause is anticipation. <laughs> remember the, the Heinz commercial? Sure. Anticipation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, yeah. <laughs> so it's creating more of a lean in. We're told that people have shorter attention spans. And it's not that they have shorter attention spans, it's that there are more distractions. And so your goal using sound is to make sure that you keep people intrigued and interested in silence is one of the ways because we're uncomfortable with it, we're unfamiliar with it. It's rare, so when we hear it, it keeps our attention. Yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. <laughs> So moving on into another element of the speech writing process, do you, how much storytelling takes place in that? How important is that in a speech? I'm going to go rogue here. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> say something, I'll say something that most people won't, mm -hmm. and that is stories are overrated. Okay. Uh, that's, that's sacrilege in speaking industry, but I'll, I'll explain why. Stories are incredibly, they are important, but they are no more important than an analogy or a metaphor or a quotation because they're simply a tool that helps you to get your point across. Abraham Maslow said, if the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, then you treat all of life's problems as if they were nails. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So a story isn't necessarily um, necessary to, to right. emotionally to emotionally connect with the people that you're speaking to. You can do that in other ways is what you're saying. Absolutely. If you think about the I have a dream speech, if I say what's the most successful or most influential speech in the history, at least of the US, mm -hmm. most people will say I have a dream. If you were to study the entire I Have a Dream speech, give me your guess as to how many stories you think are in there. 
Um, I, I don't know, maybe one. I mean, you would hope that there's at least one. <laughs> Zero. Zero? Zero. Okay. So you think about the most influential speech that people are going to think about the top of their head. Yeah. No stories whatsoever. What he did is he painted word pictures. Uh, okay. He may have given examples, but he used different techniques like what is called anaphora, which is another way to create a hook. Okay. And after the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of a sentence, I have a dream that happened many times. Or he would ask the question, when will we be satisfied? We will never be satisfied. Mm -hmm. He repeated that so many times. He gave the analogy of the Emancipation Proclamation being a promissory note and that America had written the Negro a bad check, a okay. check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Mm hmm. Okay. So that if, if, if you go back and watch that speech and you hear the eruption, if you've ever written an NSF check. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> business people, right? It, it connects it, it just like anyone, anything else would in a story, it brings about emotion. And so, okay. that's the key. Storytelling really is about emotion, but you can create emotion with a picture. You can create emotion with a quote. Yeah. And when you create the emotion, that's when all the chemicals that you hear about, the, the oxytocin and everything else in storytelling. So it's painting word pictures or repetition. So are stories important? Absolutely. Because people like to see themselves in our stories, they're easy to listen to. The relatability. Exactly. By the same token, so is an NSF check. <laughs> exactly. Yes, we all understand what that is and, and where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. So repeating the the experience of the person making that speech and relating it to who's listening. Bingo. Uh, so that they can understand what's being talked about <laughs> in their own terms. Absolutely. And that's what it comes down to. That's where, as you said, relatability. Yes. That's what connects us when we can say, oh, yeah, I've been there before. And so that's why I love giving that description. Stories are great. Mm -hmm. We tell them about the campfire. We want to lean in. At the same time, if you want to explore it, use it as the hammer. When you need a screwdriver or sandpaper, make sure you have those other elements in your toolbox. I love that. Yeah, that's a very good point, too. So it doesn't always answer every question. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Are there some tips, like quick tips that you would give people to better communicate in their daily lives? I mean, besides active listening, which <laughs> is always a thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Number one is intent. Intent means everything. When you go into a conversation, what is your purpose for being there? Very often, we want to answer people. And so as they are speaking, we're not listening to what they're saying to understand it. We're listening to respond to it. So very often, mm -hmm. we're, we're responding to what we thought we heard. If we have the intention that we listen, one, without judgment, and then two, for understanding, that our action will be different and that we're not going to respond next if we don't understand. We're going to say, OK, help me understand. I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Is this what you meant? So rather than assuming you understood, clarify. There, there's a quote that says, I know you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard was not what I meant. <laughs> OK, well, that's confusing. <laughs> And that's listening in, in and of itself. We, we yeah. think we hear it, but we're not hearing what they mean. Mm -hmm. Be sure to go back and clarify. That would be number one. And then I like to say, sit across the table. If you were playing a game of chess, you wouldn't just think about your own moves. You would be thinking about the moves of the other person. In other words, when I move my pawn here, when I move my knight here or my rook or whatever it is, when I move it, what will that person be seeing on their side of the table? What are the possible responses they could have to where I just moved my piece? The moment I start thinking in that vein, I'm now putting myself on their side of the table. I'm literally getting inside their brain and saying, how do they see this? Imagine if we did that in our communications, where instead of just- oh, Empathy. Ah, yes. 
Yes. So instead of just trying <laughs> to get a point across, I'm now seeing it from your side of the table. That changes the conversation mm -hmm. 100%. Definitely. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the the world in, at large could use a little more empathy. <laughs> oh yes, and it's not easy. That's that's the point. I'm saying it like it's easy. No. It's not because you know there is more at stake than when you're playing a chess game. There's those self limiting beliefs, or there are past cultural beliefs, and to as we say, noise. When you talk about sound, <laughs> to filter out all the noise that goes through our head as we're trying to listen to what the person is really saying. Whew. <laughs> There's a lot to cut through. There is. <laughs> I totally understand that one. <laughs> Thank you so much to the people that have taken the time to leave an honest review of this podcast. I know it takes a bit of effort to do, and I know how busy and, let's face it, kind of stressful our lives are right now. So it means a lot that you take the time to leave some feedback. Ran MCK writes, How important is sound? Jody covers all frequencies of sound through her research and her guests. Her interviews with Tal and Hamish provide insight on how audio can be heard, not just listened to. Jody's voice keeps you listening and want to hear more. I have become a better listener. Thank you, Ran MCK. I really appreciate your kind words. Now, back to the show. So out of curiosity, have you had any clients that you've worked with that have seen big improvements after they worked with you? Absolutely. And that is the, a thrill for me. I've had some of my clients, one in particular, who she came to me for the interview process because she had been at a university for, I think it was 12 years. So had been in this job for quite some time and had never thought about the need. This is where she's going to retire and COVID hits. Oh, okay. So the universities are downsizing. They had to let her go, which meant that she now had to interview for another job. And in our very first call, which I always do a 30 minute call with them to find out whether or not we're a good fit. She says, if I may be frank, I don't even know that I'm capable of doing this job. So we talked, we had the discussion and afterwards we decided, okay, we're, we're gonna go for this. She had not worked on those skills for over 12 years because there was no need to. Mm -hmm. But in the end, she ended up improving to such a degree that she was able to get the job. So for her, and this was at a completely different university with people that she did not know, mm -hmm. and she, she came through and came out on the top because of her ability to get through those interviews and answer clearly and concisely. So for me, I love those wins and I, I have a number of those where it's at a very high level and my clients go in and they deliver more than they thought they were capable of. For me, there's, there's, there's nothing better. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is super helpful, especially in an interview, I imagine. <laughs> Are there any other situations that were outside of the interview idea? Did, have, you, have you worked with people who actually had to do a public speech? Yes. And that's I mean, I'm from, assuming you have, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's from TED Talks to pitches to presentations to the board. There are so many different scenarios. And what I usually find is whoever the speaker is wants to give more information than the audience needs to hear. Yes. And so it's just this fire hose of, of information and when I talked about silence and giving the person the opportunity to stop and digest, that was never part of their process. So I dialed down to what's most important about what you have to say, not just most important to you, but what's most important to them, what addresses their need, yeah. their pain. Because mm -hmm. guess what, when, when we start hearing something that relates to us, we listen. When you start talking about something that you care about, but doesn't necessarily hit a nerve for us, we start daydreaming about something that's going on in our lives. Yeah. It's all about what's in it for us, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So my key is always to get my, my presenters, speakers to think through what is the need of the person you're speaking to. And it always comes through that they hear, wow, you've, you've, improved you've done so much better yes i will take that 
So I, again, I love seeing that transformation, especially from the people who didn't think they were able. That for me is the best. <laughs> I imagine, yeah. <laughs> That's, and it's an amazing skill to have. Have you seen similarities between the types of skills that are needed between a TED Talk, a presentation before a board, an interview? Like, are there, are there similar threads throughout all of that? That, I mean, besides the what's in it for them type, you know, you got to pay attention to what your audience wants to hear. <laughs> yes. Well, confidence is also one. Okay. Good point. Yeah. We pick up on the energy as an audience listening to you. And if you are vibrating nervousness, which comes through <laughs> in the vocal tone and, and the lack of breathing, there's so many different ways that it manifests itself. Sure. We can't be comfortable as your audience while you are about to faint. We, we're feeling it <laughs> and we're hoping you don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> no one wants to see you faint. <laughs> and it's a big one. It really is where you think, oh, gosh, I hope they're going to make it because you know they don't want to be there. So that is a, a big one that has to happen across all elements. And I, I say this to my speakers. If you have not prepared, then you have every right to be nervous. <laughs> if, if you're winging it, yes, nervous is a good feeling. Mm -hmm. But I also say, because I remember the first time I ever went on stage in The Lion King, stage fright for the very first time got a hold of me and it wasn't letting go. Oh, yeah. And I realized the importance of a warm up routine beforehand to get rid of all the tension in the body so that the nerves are gone and you can stand confidently and deliver. Yeah, I was going to ask you because, I mean, what do people do if they're that nervous? Is there besides, so you're saying a run through beforehand will give them enough confidence to go out there and do what they need to do. If they're having a trouble, like if they're, if they're going to, if they look like they're going to faint, <laughs> what, what do you tell them to do? Is there a way for them to do it when they're already out there? Something to do that could calm them down? Yes. Now, there, I'll say this. It's always better to calm yourself beforehand. <laughs> yes, I will agree. <laughs> and, and so I always I always say, you know what, prepare before you get to the stage. This should be a daily habit. That being said, if you're in the midst of it and you have practice and anxiety creeps up, your breathing is the key to calming yourself down. Because you can lower your heart rate and calm yourself by the proper breathing techniques. And so we call this diaphragmatic breathing. And anyone in theater arts and, and who sings will do this type of breathing. It's also used in yoga and mindfulness, mm -hmm. where you take that deep breath, imagining that you have a balloon inside your stomach. Yes. And as you breathe in, the balloon expands, you hold it for a few seconds, and you exhale slowly. And that slow exhale brings your heart rate down and calms you down. So at any point where you feel nervous, it usually means you haven't been breathing. In fact, <laughs> I watch speakers who gulp on air because they've been speaking without taking a breath. So it's, it's really one affecting the other, or they breathe sh in a shallow way, not from the diaphragm, they breathe from the chest, and that actually increases the heart rate. So mm. that the one- The tension. Yes. Yeah. That one technique alone, increase your heart rate or decrease it, make you nervous or help you to be relaxed. So if you breathe better, breathe consciously and with intention, you'll be able to center yourself. And then even as you speak and breathe at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, um, a vocal coach on here on the podcast, her name is Cynthia Jai, and she's in Singapore. And one of the things that she mentioned was that a lot of people don't know how to breathe, that a lot of people have forgotten that when you breathe, your your stomach is supposed to go out, not in. <laughs> and yes, so teaching yes. yourself to breathe properly is like one of the first things people need to do, because that can let you let let loose of the tension 
as opposed to when we learned when we were tense and we learned and we were like taking in our breath, <laughs> right? Like and exactly. everything's coming in. Like, yeah. <laughs> so we don't really recognize it. We're promoting that nervousness. Yeah. I, I in a lot of cases, I think people don't realize that your stomach should go out when you breathe instead of in. <laughs> So paying attention to that. Well, that's because society teaches us to take a picture and uh, hold it in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it's something we learn, you know, like people learn when they're tense that they keep it in, you know. So, yeah, learning how to let it out is a good thing to know. <laughs> it is. And I'll tell you what, it's also a... A, an automatic reaction that we continue to learn. I have a little bit of a background in personal training as well. I ran a fitness studio. Okay. And the number one instruction I gave to my clients was breathe. <laughs> yeah. Because if a weight was heavy, you think people would know. <laughs> they're concentrating so hard, and this is, should be an automatic function breathing. We need it to survive. Mm -hmm. No, people stop breathing when they concentrate too hard, try to lift too heavy or they're, they're trying to do an exercise they haven't done before. So yes, it, it should be automatic. I gave that instruction so many times, breathe. They go, yeah. oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big thing and, and we don't pay enough attention to it. <laughs> Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website, and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. Switching uh, gears just a little bit, I want to sort of talk about Clubhouse a little before we we uh, end this conversation, because I know that that's where we met. And uh, I was curious yeah. as to your background on that. So how did you get interested in Clubhouse and get participating on there? My coach got me onto Clubhouse because there was a show. This wasn't her intention. It wasn't why she did it, but it's how she did it. Mm -hmm. She got me onto Clubhouse when the Lion King, there was a group of people performing the Lion King live on the app. So she mm -hmm. said, hey, they're doing the Lion King. Sign on, get an account, listen to this. She had been on for at least a month before. So I went on and I, I listened to the show and I thought, oh, this is, this is really cool. You know, I like that they went through it all. And then I didn't go back on the app for a few days. And it was New Year's Eve. I finally decided to log back on and see what was happening. And there were just nice rooms where they were doing voiceovers and they were doing New Year's resolutions. And that's how I became more interested in it as a learning vehicle, which was my coach's intention all along. But she just had to find a way to get me there because I'm not a social media person. I don't like social media. I, I'm an introvert by nature. Oh, I, I sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> so even even on on Facebook, you, you write a comment. What do people do? They like it. They comment back. And as an introvert, you think, ah, now I got to comment again. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't do a lot of Facebook or a lot of Instagram. Because when people respond, I just feel like the energy that I have to exert. Not that I don't like people. Or I, don't, don't want to say, I do like people, but they're responding. It's like, oh, okay, this is going to take some time. The obligation required. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> I get it. <laughs> but then you get on Clubhouse and it's a conversation. And I love one on one conversations or even small group conversations where I'm made to think more and I can learn and I can grow. 
And that is what Clubhouse has been for me in, in that I can pick up all these pieces from so many people that I would never have the opportunity to connect with before. And the fact that we're just hearing voices, uh, I, again, because I love sound, <laughs> that the sound of the voice is excellent. It's, it's been a tremendous app for me. Yeah, I love it. And by the way, you make a great co-host. <laughs> so so for anyone who is interested, we have a Power of Sound Club where I have talks about the power of voice, the power of podcasting, the power of storytelling, and uh, the power of music. And, and then sort of toss in the power of audio branding in all of that. And, uh, and, and you've been in some of those and, uh, and co-hosting as well, which I really appreciate. So you're welcome anytime. Um, just if people, yeah, if people are interested, that's uh, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So anyone's welcome to drop by and, and we're always looking for a co-host. So, you know, let us know. And this is all voice. It's all sound. I love it as much as you do. <laughs> uh, and I've met a lot of really cool people from from being on there. And And what I find is the interesting thing about social media, and I'm kind of with you, I'm not even on Instagram. <laughs> Wow. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and Facebook is not really a place that I do anything other than chat with friends at the moment. So it's like <laughs> I don't do anything really there. Um, but the reason that I even mention Clubhouse is because it's a social network in the way that I want it to be a social network, the way that you were talking about it as a conversation. And less obligation because you can sit in the audience and just listen. You don't have to raise your hand and come up and talk. And you can just glean the information that's being spoken about in the room and not have any obligation at all. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I love that opportunity nice. to sit back and learn. And even when I go into your room, there's something that I'm going to take away because of, of the guests that you have and because of your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there's so much of that. And people can get lost in the big rooms, but I have found the ones that I like and I stick with them and it, it makes it so much more rewarding. Yeah, the smaller rooms are a lot better for conversation. <laughs> yes. It's a little easier to actually share information as opposed to just sitting back and listening. I've, I don't know about you, but I find it really, really intimidating to try and speak in a room with like 100 people. It, it, actually, in a room with 50 people, it can be a little much. Like that's a lot. I would rather have one-on-one -on -one conversations the way you do. So the rooms being small. I like that a lot. I love the small rooms. I don't mind the bigger rooms, uh, but I have found that when I speak in them, I speak a couple times and that's it because there seems to be more competition in large rooms for people to shout from the mountaintop. I just, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can true, only true. do so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fellow introvert, like, yes. you know, I get it. Yes. Uh, and I don't want to fight them. You know, like I have no interest, kind of like the obligation, the whole I have to fight for my moment of, of you know, being heard annoys me. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So not my idea of a good time. But listening and, and not having that obligation of doing anything other than listening, that's quite nice. I could totally do that. But yeah, Clubhouse is one of many social audio networks now so there are a bunch more that are coming in and i guess this is the power of sound because we want to hear each other's voices i think that's pretty awesome <laughs> and, and i'm finding that amusing because you know we've gone through hearing about how important video is going to be and it is we still mm -hmm. want to get back to people's voices and all of that it's powerful. It really is. And also, you have to pay full attention to a video. If you're listening to something, you can do other stuff while you're listening. Yeah. So that makes it a little more accessible, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. We don't have to dress up to, to get on Zoom and all of that. I so appreciate that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No one needs to see me if I'm on Clubhouse. I, I could be in my PJs. No one would know. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so if people want to get in touch with you, how is the best way for them to do that? The easiest way is by email. 
john at johnwatkiss.com. Or if you must, you can find me on social media. <laughs> uh -huh. I, everything is John Watkiss. I don't have a fancy, fancy handles, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn. It's John Watkiss and easy to find on social media. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I learned a ton, so I hope my audience will learn a ton too. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Jody. As always, fun hanging out with you and, and talking as introverts do. Oh, likewise. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.